Kia ora koutou, everyone. A welcome to HR Chats with me, Tereda. This is where I, Tereda, chat about all things HR. If you have been listening to the series, you'll know that we are speaking to some of the leading lights in the HR fraternity around trends and ideas and movements in this critical time of human resources. We have a diverse range of people and topics on the show. And as we mentioned at the start and the end of each show, if there is anyone you would like us to speak to, is there any topic you would like us to speak on, then by all means, get in touch with HRNZ. There is a link on the website where you are no doubt listening to this. Flick them an email and they will flick me an email and then we will get together and figure out who it is that you want to hear from and what it is you want to hear. Today's topic, particularly pertinent as is today's guest, Jonathan Black, is a chartered organisational psychologist. He is the founder of Farsight Limited. Started his career as a psychologist with the New Zealand Police, actually. Uh, responsibilities there including occupational health of frontline staff, the provision of specialist technical advice, assisting decision-making and critical incident management responses. Left the police in 2002 after an eight-year career with them. Went into private practice in Wellington and then in Christchurch and then, you know, probably I suspect not only for his own mental health, but the mental health of his family, uh, he's moved to the beautiful Hawke's Bay. Why, mm. why would you not move to Hawke's Bay, Jonathan? How is Hawke's Bay? Hawke's Bay is absolutely fantastic. It's a beautiful climate. It's lovely people. It's just the right size. It's got access to everything. If you love wine and food, it's, it's a brilliant place. We come up for the lifestyle. And unfortunately, we've been so busy, we haven't been able to enjoy it. But isn't that like? Hey, you have been busy, you know, as well as dealing with all those other things that I've mentioned. You've also been involved with, you know, the Christchurch earthquake clusters, the March uh, incident down in Christchurch, and, and then in the humanitarian sector, you know, with personnel from New Zealand and Australia across the world. And so pertinent then for today's one, uh, lessons from a crisis, learnings from leaders. Where do you, where do you, where are we? Where are we at this exact moment in time? We didn't even start. Yeah, it's uh, Lessons from a Crisis. Uh, the, the, the title of this is really, really broad. And at the current point in time, there are some significant challenges. But as much as we think about COVID-19 as being unique, and in some respects, it definitely is unique. You know, the global reach of it, the greater interconnectivity, the economic impact, and so on. Uh, a number of different parts around the world have been through a pandemic before. And there are lessons we can learn from them in terms of how they responded in the past, even though they have been so they have been so so connected in that particular space. One of the challenges we had, especially probably around March, when we were originally looking at how we were going to respond to a potential pandemic response, was we had no effective model to follow. But there are certainly some lessons we can apply from past uh, events and clusters of events. I think about the Christchurch earthquake cluster. That's the most relevant New Zealand experience to kind of go back to. And while there's a lot of caution about applying those kinds of models to the current environment, we're seeing a lot of the similar stuff because as a species, especially at a community level, not so much at an individual level, but at a community level, we tend to respond very similarly around challenges, for example, social disruption, economic uncertainty, uh, uh, health challenges. And I don't mean health challenges just in terms of infection, for example, or community spread regarding COVID-19 but also in terms of access to hospitals, access to GPs, access to healthcare that is disrupted for those that are more vulnerable and so on. Um, what this means for how we get a business back on track when we can't plan when uh, facilities are disrupted. And while from the earthquake perspective, you've got a disruption in infrastructure and you don't have it for COVID-19, you still can't access those regular services. And all these aspects, are, they're actually very, very common. And how we respond as a species in terms of anxiety, the need for planning and communication, uh, is pretty much standard. It's just that the flavour and the colours are a little bit different, but the frame is still the same. Is there a difference in the way that people react with, I suppose, a tangible incident like the Christchurch earthquake? If you are there and you are living through it and you can, you can see it, you can see the disruption. Here, for example, with COVID, it's a little bit more intangible. It, it's it's there and it's not not and and it's more you know we're seeing people who are saying it's all a matter of opinion an earthquake is not a matter of opinion it's that's a thing not. that's happened yeah. you know and so we're seeing a sort of a a fraying in people there's an anxiety and a fear and an anger over the sense that people are saying this is not the way to go forward this is this is not a thing and other people saying this is a this is a terrifying thing it, it, how, how do you deal with the two different scenarios yeah that's a really good question and we think about how we uh, interpret data around us and how we obtain information from the world around us. Now, I read this many, many years ago, but from memory, and someone out there listening to this will probably correct me and say, no, JB, you're wrong. 
around about 70 percent of our understanding of the world around us comes from our eyesight reading your body language you know looking at people looking at what's going on around us so you're absolutely right you take that element away it becomes very hard to process what is actually going on probably a real challenge in this space too and one of the key ways of managing it is actually where do we get our information from <clears throat> and as i'm sure you've experienced yourself and others will have experienced too in the current environment when we can't see it we want to find out something to actually understand it we go to media mainstream media social media other avenues to try and get information but as a consequence of that, we become a little bit overwhelmed. One of the things we often see with a natural disaster like an earthquake is that what is a key priority is often very, very clear. You know, my wall has fallen off my house, which actually happened to me actually in 2010, um, literally like a doll's house, you know, or you can't get food, you can't get water. How do you educate your children? The schools are closed or whatever. It's very clear and present. The challenge with the pandemic is that there's no obvious clarity as to what should I do now? What is the immediate level of risk to me? What is the immediate priority? And that becomes a massive challenge, especially with confusion of different kinds of information coming in. So one of the key aspects around moving forward, especially regarding leadership as a crisis, is being really clear as to what are our next steps? What's our plan? What's our intent? What's right in front of us we're gonna deal with in trying to minimize catastrophization because we, we don't have that information. And by seeking it, often we actually ignore what we can do that empowers us and we become distracted by stuff that actually in general kind of gets in the way and affects our ability to adapt and to recover. And there is so much stuff and you were mentioning all the many and myriad ways that people can find out their information for, for leaders and, and for leadership. How, how do they become the focus of that information to an point that, that, that ability to disseminate information and then how powerful are their voices when there's all of this other chatter coming around? Yeah. It, yeah, and a number of organisations, number of leaders, really challenging in that space. We've got all this different confusion, all these different uh, pathways and streams of information and data kind of coming in. One of the key aspects too is around rather than keep, like for example, saying a lot and frequently, is saying little bits frequently. So you're increasing your points of contact, you're increasing the normalisation and expectation around those points. By keeping it short and sweet, you're also focusing on simplicity. One of the challenges we have in this space, it's a classic VUCA acronym. So vulnerability, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. We need to reduce that. If we are, for example, saying a lot without being really clear and coherent as to the intent behind that and summarizing that and so on, we're actually contributing to that. So small points of contact more frequently, but not as much information really kind of help kind of cut through that because what people need is simplicity, not complexity. We need to kind of reduce that. Also being sensitive to, sensitive to where people are at in their diverse experience as well. Yeah. How important then is that, is that ability to disseminate that information personally? We've, we've known during the lockdown, people have become very familiar with, uh, with, with Zoom, with Skype, with Facebook Live, with, with, with TikTok, you know, all of the, there are all of these platforms now. How important is, is it for leaders when they're wanting to get that information out there to, to disseminate that personally? versus sending out an email is, is is there a difference is there there's obviously a role for both you know a the, oh, there's PDF. Def, yeah there's definitely a role for both and we go back to that classic what role does email play it's great for information distribution it's great for efficiency but if you need to connect with people you can still use for example zoom as a format but how do you start to personalize it how do you create that opportunity to connect one-on-one to inquire more deeply about where people are at. One of the challenges we have at the moment, for example, I've used this metaphor before, is it's almost like everyone is on a carpet. You can call it a flying carpet if you want, but everyone's got a strand in that particular carpet. As we go along, that carpet, those strands start to unravel. And as it starts to unravel, we get a lot of that diversity of experience. And it's a real challenge for leaders to get across that diversity of experience. It's much easier early on, but when people kind of go on their own journeys, it starts to unravel a little bit. So that's where that personal connection makes really makes a lot of sense. It could be touching base through Zoom, it could be kind of taking, re-changing re how we do our agenda, kind of normalizing, uh, hey, where are we at personally, how things are going on, not so much at home, but where you're at with your personal interests or what might be going on, this particular piece of work. Um, or it might be touch, a touching point, a private chat, or, or a text message, or a FaceTime. It, it could be something a little bit different, but it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it is really important, but I think in the current context here, there's no rule or no model to follow. It's more about recognizing what do I want to achieve here and what fits? Is it purely information delivery and efficiency? Or do I need to connect? Do I need to inquire? Do I need to explore and listen? And that's much better done, yeah, with some kind of personal content. 
goes back to what you were saying earlier on. We take in seventy percent of what we know visually. You you can find out a lot more, I suspect, about someone by having that kind of face to face conversation, even through through the medium of a of a device, than simply trying to ascertain how they are through the tone of their emails or or, or even perhaps a phone call. You know, yeah, you, to be able to see someone to think, oh, they don't. It doesn't seem right. Or you you might see something that's perhaps happening in the background or or not. Yeah, absolutely. And at the current point in time, especially if we have if we have repeat incidents of community outbreak, no matter how small, how, mal, how large they actually may be, and we'll get on top of it, that increases that sense of vulnerability. And one of the challenges we have at the moment is as a society, we tend to see vulnerability as very much a black and white thing. I'm vulnerable or I'm okay. And it's not. It's a big kind of mix in the middle. And trying to normalise that sense of where are we at is actually really, really valuable and really, really important rather than kind of having this kind of conversation and asking someone, where are you at? And someone's saying, okay, and it's the end of the conversation. How do we insert some other inquiry-based stuff into it so we get an understanding of where this person is at and they feel comfortable with just, just kind of sharing without being worried about that whole kind of vulnerability kind of conversation? Because that's really where we're all at. When it comes to health and well-being in, in the workforce, what are the role of of HR and, and, and leaders within that workforce to, at this point in time particularly, make sure that people are not only okay in their work, is there a responsibility to make sure that their workforce, that their workers are okay on a broader sense as well, that their families are okay? There's a lot to deal with. Where do the boundaries mm. change? Are we in a, in a place where those boundaries have shifted? Yeah, the boundaries have definitely shifted because in a way we kind of, my thought is smart thought leaders are having a conversation about how are we defining performance and productivity? It's not on a traditional work site necessarily. It may have been for a period of time, then we're kind of coming out of it. But that's a really valuable conversation to have. How do we define performance and productivity? How do we define duty of care? If someone is working remotely away from the traditional workspace and they're using somebody at home to do that or the community to do that, what does that mean for our basic kind of responsibilities? So these, one of the positive things that will come out of this are some conversations that will be very, very valuable that will define for people what it means to be working and not working, how we switch off, how we switch on in, a, in an environment that's very, very flexible um, and very kind, of, very kind of diverse in terms of how we actually go about undertaking, undertaking work. Yeah. So with that, what are the sum of perhaps the, the unthought of, the unexpected, the hidden challenges, uh, you know, regarding health and well-being in this, you know, continuingly COVID-based world? Yeah, one of them I, I kind of mentioned just alluded to a bit earlier on is what does duty of care mean now? You know, you take us away from the traditional workspace in terms of a geographical location and you, you have a, a multiple kind of geographical, geographical locations. What does that mean, as you alluded to before, an employer's responsibility to take care of an employee? What does that mean when we're in a community sense where a broader whanau is impacted? And for example, my partner's lost their job or they cannot work and I'm or I've got to educate my children at home. And is there anyone who's trying to educate their children from home while having work responsibilities? That's a big ask. That's a really big ask. And just because my journey of doing that worked doesn't mean your journey of doing that worked either. And so how do we have some sensitivity kind of around that as well is really, really important. Um, staying in touch, connecting, communicating, defining what's, I come back to that, 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 that sense before, there are some lessons that we have learned from our previous, not just lockdown experience, but stages of lockdown. And one of the things that's probably really important to recognize at the moment is the language that we use. We use the term lockdown at the moment, for example, is, is very, very broadly, yet there are four different stages. And one of the things we've learned from our prior experience is how we've transitioned from one to the other, have we actually kind of taken stock and thought about that. I've done a lot of work, for example, recently, where employees and teams have come straight back into work. And what they've realized is they had no time to defuse, to debrief, to think, what have we learned? How are we going to do this better next time? They just kind of come back into it. And so there are opportunities here for leaders to actually really, in HR, to really think about how do we do this differently next time? What are the fundamental assumptions we made that were valid? What are some of the assumptions that we made that actually, in hindsight, weren't so valid? We know, for example, that how do we enhance self-care is more important in the community and that our sense of managing health and welfare than it is for, man for managing, for example, risk of catastrophization, other aspects like that. So how do we enable and empower individuals to make those choices, but at the same time, um, uh, be aware of actually, what do we mean by performance and productivity in that very remote space? 
We saw some great examples. I think it was the last uh, HRNZ summit uh, with some people and uh, one of the women there said, look, we had all our staff coming back. I just went out the day before on Facebook Live and I walked the route that they would arrive uh, so that they, they knew this is the car park, this is where the check-in is, this is what yeah. this is going. So not only did they know what they had to do, but they were reassured, perhaps their families would have been reassured that, okay, uh, you know, my workplace is taking this really seriously. They've got it all sorted out. That's a weight off my mind. I don't have to, it's like the first day of school, isn't it? You go back oh, and you're a bit much. anxious. Very Where much. are the toilets? Um, yeah, very much. Can, yeah. you know, uh, can I use them? So, so there's, there's all of those kind of little reassurances as well. Uh, what about in terms of managing a workforce that is potentially anxious, fearful or, or or riven with a little bit of dissent around some of this mm. we're seeing you know we saw it in america the polarization and, we, and we're seeing it very much here uh, over the last few days as well the polarization of belief around where we're at with this what is is there an hr challenge in that when teams come back and suddenly there's a friction there you know I, yeah. i've seen people literally come to the closest you can have to facebook blows about this mm. you take that mm. offline and into the workplace suddenly you've got a whole nother cause of disruption and dissent. Yeah, you do. And when you get strong emotion, you've, you've, you've got to create a space for it to be expressed. And that requires, from a leadership and HR perspective, you know, to have some pretty broad shoulders sometimes, create that opportunity for people's narrative to be heard, to listen, to understand, to ask those clarifying questions. Sometimes to absorb, yeah, you're right, we could have done this better. Or other times to say, actually, I hear what you're saying. I agree with where you're at. But looking back on it, we couldn't have done anything differently. But hey, we're open to ideas. How do we kind of work on this moving forward? Because in the, the day, we are all in the same boat. But what you're saying comes down to people's diversity of experience. Some people are particularly anxious. And so how people respond to, for example, coming back up, you know, they, the risk ladder in terms of in the lockdown stage and so on, we will get those who will be simply fatigued and they'll just be over it. You'll get those who are already very anxious. And so that will start to enhance that. And you talked about one of the key strategies about managing anxiety, which was to focus on routines, planning, preparation. We try to remove the unknown. The key thing about managing people with high, high levels of anxiety is how do we minimize surprises? If we identify fears, how do we minimize those? But at the same time, not blowing smoke. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty that we cannot plan for. But what can we do? And what can these individuals do that we feel empowered? What often happens too with a lot of individuals that do get into that high, high, highly anxious space um, is they tend to think out here when they, they stop thinking right in front of them. It comes back to what I said before. What's right in front of us? What are our key priorities here and now? Give me something to do. But again, strong emotion, we've got to create a space to listen to it. Because if we don't, it gets buried. It comes up like whack a mole it's going to be a big problem. Yep. And that emotion, as you say, can vary for many people. You know, for those of us, uh, you know, who've just gone back into the sort of the level three lockdown, you know, I, I've lost some work that's upsetting to me, you know, but then I think I didn't have any staff that I had to pay. I didn't have a whole lot of food that I'd ordered for my cafe that's sitting in. So, so everyone's experience is a little bit different, isn't it? So how, how do people, how do people deal? I guess it's a, a notion of kind of empathy and understanding that for you know, not for, for everyone, this entire situation is going to be very, very different or for their partners or for their family. So some of those stresses will be coming in. You'll think, oh, this is okay for you. Our, our, we're all fine here. Why are you so anxious or upset or, or you know, going through, we're well, going through grief. There's, there's grief, forms of grief, I guess, as well. Yeah, yeah, there is forms of grief. There's a really neat model on YouTube and I can't remember who it is, but I'll just describe it very briefly, but it's very, very synonymous to what you mentioned, that basically initially when something happens, grief is all-encompassing. It touches every single part of our life. But as it kind of comes through, it, it turns into, into a smaller ball and touches different parts, but in a smaller, more manageable way. It never quite goes away. We still have the lessons. But when something comes along like an anniversary or a birthday or an event, it all of a sudden kind of gets large and touches everything else again, and then it kind of comes back again. And so it's that pinball kind of effect that's going to go on for quite some period of time. So, so grief is... Yeah, grief is, is a real thing because, of course, grief is about loss. And so we think about individually for a whānau, for a community, what have we lost? The fear is, in a certain sense, is this ever going to end? You know, we talked about managing anxiety and about moving, removing surprises and, and trying to create predictability. This goes completely against that, doesn't it? So managing that and trying to keep that in a small way, people's sense of enablement and control and empowerment and what they can do. And a sense of progress is really important too. And I come back to some work I've done now and, and in the past. 
that sense of progress that we are moving forward, both professionally and personally, even in small ways, goes a long way to assisting later recovery and adaptation. Yeah. If anyone was going to go away from here with a, a few sort of crucial, I guess, HR lessons, what do you oh think gosh. they would be? If you could sum them up, a couple, couple of key points. Um, remove communication vacuums. Um, more frequent communication, but less of it. Keep it really simple. Be very aware too that vulnerability changes the lens through which people interpret what we say and what we do. And you know that increased sensitivity, which doesn't mean someone is sensitive, just means they're simply impacted, is really, really important. Probably the last thing I think about to keep it really, really brief too, is that one of the concerns I'm hearing too is about the risk of trauma. You know, this is a very powerful incident in different ways. And we think about trauma, we think about a really kind of heavy, kind of intense kind of incident. Um, but to a certain degree for certain individuals, their experience going through COVID-19 in terms of in terms of risk to their own direct health and well-being in different kinds of ways doesn't have to be real, it can be perceived, and that's very real for some individuals. So for HR, there are probably two key things to really think about in that space. Number one is being aware of individuals' exposure. And again, it comes down to that diversity of experience with their personal journey. Whatever their threat is on the carpet, wherever that might be, that happens to be their journey, or what's their relative level of exposure. And the second thing is the relative level of their ability to have respite from that. So one of the risks, for example, in a pandemic, if we get recurring incidents of community spread, for example, um, is that that removes the element of being able to manage fatigue. We get fatigued very, very quickly. So those two things, exposure and fatigue, from an HR perspective, we monitor and manage that and put those moments of respite in and enablement and empowerment and self-care and so on. They're going to be really, really important moving forward because we're expecting this is going to last for probably a good 12, 18 months in different ways. Talk to me about the, I'm just thinking during, you know, your conversation there around those frontline staff, your mm. supermarket checkout people, your security guards, those people who are the essential workers, they're often at the lower end of the pay spectrum. They have yeah. a whole lot of inequalities that, that, yeah. that others in the sort of the, the higher levels may not have. Um, they may, you know, we've seen it in, in places like Australia, they have to come to work if they, you know, don't come to work if you're sick, but if I'm sick, I you know, I can't get paid. Can there's, yeah. there's stresses. I can't eat. I can't, you know, um, yeah. they have the stresses of, of, we saw this, uh, you know, last few days that the supermarket panic and there were people saying, look, this Wednesday was a, a, a day when a lot of low income people go shopping. They couldn't get to the supermarket to get what they needed because other people had rushed in. How, how do you cope with those, those people who are there on the very front lines and, and they're having to deal, you know, someone at a supermarket checkout, it's, it's above their pay grade to have to deal with the anger and the fear of these people in these lines. You know, we saw the security guards the other day at the supermarket trying to keep, trying to get this, this tide of panicked humans out of that supermarket in New Lynn. W what do you say to those people? How do you help them? How do you, is there a, a different way of negotiating their pathway? Yeah, one of the interesting things that's obviously come out of our, our previous experience, you know, and, and, and before lockdown has been probably a greater appreciation of those, I, wouldn't, I was about to use the word hidden, that's the wrong term, but you know, those members of our workforce, generally speaking, don't get as much attention and recognition and credit as supermarket workers, our cleaners, you know, uh, as security guards, those that are essential and really, really important to our society. And coming back to the question made before, there's going to be an individual perspective in that, you know, someone's individual where they're at in their particular journey, whatever they're encountering, for example, the supermarket operator on checkout and so on. But probably some key things there are going to be to actually keep things in balance too, because chances are they're going to get some, some real sticks, some real challenges. But there's probably going to be a huge number of people out there as well who are going to be very, very appreciative and very respectful and really value what they do. So a plug for those individuals is to express your gratitude, to express your thanks. Because when that starts to counter the other stuff, you know, we remember the negative very easily. But when that starts to be counted by people saying, hey, thank you very much, really appreciate what you're doing. I'm sorry I rushed today. I'm just, you know, whatever's going on. That, humanitar that humanitarianism in all of us is extraordinarily valuable and people feeling valued and important. From a management point, an HR point of view, being aware of it, again, monitoring those basic things, giving people permission to say, this is where I'm at, I'm okay, that's absolutely fine. Those aspects of respite. Um, validating those workers, validating their value, their importance, the service they are providing, which is utterly, utterly critical. And, and yeah, they deserve all the respect. Absolutely. Marvellous. Absolutely. And, and that is that thing we take that, we take all of that into our own personal journeys as well. You know, just that, that time out to, to, to thank people for their, for their tasks, just being kind, yeah. you know, 
even though <laughs> there's been people who say, don't tell us to be kind, it doesn't make us very kind. It's, <laughs> isn't it funny the way that people kick back against uh, some of this sort of, these suggestions? You know what I mean? It's, humans well, are funny, it, aren't it, they? It, it is interesting. And, it, and it's, a, it's a reflection of where someone's at and so on. But often I come back to people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little bit upfront here and say, sometimes we just need to get over our own shit. You know? Yeah. Let it, let it yeah. go. Let it go. Yeah. Because actually, and you would have seen this, you know, there are a lot of myths around what happens in a crisis, uh, you know, and, and we've seen this played out that the fear, people, that people will go feral, there will be looting, you know, the lowest common denominator, but it's, it's proven time and time and time again, would have seen in Christchurch a, a wonderful example. We would. We come together, mm. we band together, mm. and, we, and we, mm. we actually, the, the, the level of kind of empathy and, and care and aid for our fellow citizens actually goes up in a crisis. It does. And universally it does, especially at a community, at a community level, people band together because our world gets a lot smaller. If you think about, for example, going back to level four lockdown, how many communities got to know their neighbours a lot better or said hello a lot more when they went out for their exercise. It does happen. But be aware that as time goes on, those threads start to unravel and we kind of fall back into those basic patterns. It doesn't mean we stop caring. It just means other parts of our world start to intrude and start to distract us from that basic caring stuff so we've got to hold on to that as much as we can absolutely what a world it is how are you jonathan who looks after who looks after you you know you, you're exposed <clears throat> to a lot of this stuff uh um, you know being a psychologist it's great because i can talk to myself in the mirror and and and, and do stuff i'm only joking no, I, I do that but i'm not yeah. i don't even have qualifications <laughs> no, but that's good it's a, it's a healthy thing yeah. to do no hey yeah. i'm like anyone else you know you can you can talk to stuff but you've still got to sit back and think what am i doing you know, what are my basic habits? What are my basic kind of routines? How am I being kind to myself? How am I moving forward? You can talk about it, but you've got to be able to do it yourself and, and role model it in some capacity. Like anything, I'm on my own journey. And um, I'm happy to share that with my friends and my family too, as we all move forward together as a community. Yeah. And that's important, isn't it, actually, to, you know, to talk some of this out with people. Don't just sort of button it all up. Yeah. Last question. You've, you've seen, you know, uh, a lot of things over the years. You've dealt with a lot of things through your work with the police, through um, the multiple events in Christchurch, earthquakes and the incidents in March last year and various other things. If there was one little takeaway thing that you think, you know, you've picked up from all of that. There's a lot, a lot to unpack. But one final little thing, so, uh, like a little positive thing where you think, you know what, that's, that's one of the best things I've ever seen. That really, you know, that made a difference. That is a really broad, open-ended question. But one thing has come Thank to you. mind, and I'll, <laughs> and I'll use an analogy uh, for you. And the anal this is an analogy sometimes I use. If you imagine that you're in, in your car of life, and you're in your driver's seat, and you're driving along your highway, and it's straight out in front of you, and you see the road ahead of you, and you see the horizon, and the horizon, of course, will keep moving ahead. The horizon is always going to be the same distance away, basically, in a flat kind of horizon. We are terrible as a species of focusing on where we are going and being critical of always being far away from where we want to be. But we never look behind ourselves and remind ourselves how far of where we have come. And I think a really good point in this space is to look behind ourselves and ask, how far have we come? Because that's really the measure of progress. The, the horizon is always going to be the horizon, but we can always look back behind us and see how far we've come from where we actually started, no matter where we were actually. But what have we learned? Who have we met? Who have we loved? What have we resolved? What have we produced? There's always stuff there that shows progress and achievement and accomplishments and value. You know, and that goes back to something that someone mentioned in the very first one of these online HR uh, summits, I think, you know, the importance of remembrance. They, they, they sort of said, you know, when we're going through all of this, it's really important, particularly with the COVID scenario, to, to document everything because we very quickly forget. You know, yeah. I, we'd f yeah. and at this point, we'd even forgotten, this was, I think, in sort of May or June, we'd forgotten that the sky had turned orange at the start of the year and Australia had been a fight. All of these incredibly mm. large things. And, and as you say, we're, we're focused on here and, and, and what's happening in the future, but we forget all of these little things that have gone through. So that ability to sort of document this journey as well. Hey, well, marvellous. Thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan Black Thank down there in, in, in Hawke's Bay. Hey, look, really, really great. And, and all the best. Keep up the, keep up the good work through this sort right. of ongoing very um unpredictable journey of life that we're in but that's life isn't it you know it is, it is. cheers mate thank you very much i appreciate your time in hey we think well thank you for joining us here on hr chats with me to radar i tell you what i took away i took away an enormous amount from that
Um, thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan Black, Chartered Organisational Psychologist, Founding Director of Farsight Limited, joining us on HR Chats with me, Teredo. And as I said at the start, if there is anyone you would like us to chat to, or indeed any topic that you think you would like us to cover in this ongoing series of podcasts, then feel free to let HRNZ know. Link on the website. We'll speak again with someone else next time.